You're listening to Tech Nest, the Prop Tech Podcast. In each episode, you'll hear from Prop Tech founders, investors, and industry veterans on how they're using tech to change the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Discover market opportunities, interesting data, growth tactics, and trends driving the industry forward. This isn't just another podcast about making money in real estate. This is about how we live. And now your host, Nate Smoyer. The Shopify of real estate. That's basically what we're talking about here today. That's the comparison, at least. I've got Jason Hardy. He's the CEO of a company called Only. They're a Canadian-based company, but also working in the United States. They're bringing e-commerce to the residential real estate industry, creating a frictionless home buying experience. As they describe, it's a platform that makes real estate transactions easier through its proprietary and patent pending technology, connecting qualified buyers and sellers. And what is that technology? Well, they call it verified. You know, there's two real pieces that prevent someone from buying real estate online. There's one verifying the identity and verifying the funds and the ability to purchase that property. And Jason and his team have been working to solve for that problem. What got started in helping home builders list pricing online so that you could build your home and understand what it's going to cost is now expanding out and going to brokerages and helping realtors transact residential real estate online. The world of residential real estate has been in a bit of a, as we call it in this show, a dizzy the last few years. That might be putting it lightly and who knows when it's going to get quote unquote back to normal or if the new normal is no normal. But we talk about all that and more. We also have a lot of fun in this conversation. Uh, There's a few rabbit holes. So, you know, if you only like focused things, I suppose you find another podcast. But if you like having fun and digging into prop tech, then you're in the right place. Let's jump in. Hey, Jason. Welcome to the show. Nate, thank you for having me. Great to be here. I'm excited to have you here. Um, you might be like guest number three or four from Canada. <laughs> I knew that was going to come up early. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, I feel honored. Thank you. <laughs> now, we, we had a chance to connect here a little bit before, and you said you're from Calgary, and immediately I was like, oh, let's talk Brett the Hitman Hart. <laughs> and uh, I'm just, does he have a street? You, know, I mean, you mentioned like he's invested in some restaurants and sports teams. Does he get a street named after him somewhere? There, I don't believe there's a street named after uh, Brett the Hitman Hart in Calgary, but he is definitively a well-known uh, local celebrity. That's for sure. Now, this might come as a surprise, given the, the beard here. But growing up, I loved Anvil. I okay. was an, I was a fan of Anvil, and and for for the listeners here who didn't watch WWF. In the uh, the late '80s, early '90s, let me just paint the picture here. The Hart Foundation was Brett the Hitman Hart. It was Jim the Anvil Nightheart, and then you had their cousin, the British Bulldog, and of course uh, Owen Hart. <laughs> Owen Hart, and they right. wore these pink and black tights. I mean, bright pink. Yeah. But the Anvil, Jim the Anvil, he had this red hair goatee, and he was yes. just a maniac. His energy was off. The hook. The only one who had more energy was the Ultimate Warrior, yeah. um, which has a whole other story and probably has a lot to do with, uh, I would say, enhanced performance stimulants that yeah. many of the wrestlers at the time were um, participating with. So, yeah. well, hey, um, we'll leave that there. We've got a lot of things in real estate and some technology to talk about, and I'm excited for this. So, Jason, as always do, please introduce yourself. Let everyone know who you are and what you do. My name is Jason Hardy. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of a prop tech startup called Only, and uh, we are digitizing the home buying process and uh, delivering the industry's first buyer verification platform. Very cool. Okay, so there's a few things I want to set the stage before we we dive in. Um, so you're calling in from Canada, and then the first question I was I, I wanted to know is, you guys do both business in the U.S and in Canada. That's correct. Um, and so uh, I think most of the listeners are probably from the U.S., but as a general synopsis, um, 
what the heck is going on in residential real estate right now? Yeah, I mean, it's a tumultuous time. You know, just when I think you have to do a lot of due diligence um, when it comes to, in, you know, moving into new markets because, you know, you can make a broad assumption, which is never accurate in this particular market, that, you know, everywhere is doing poorly. But just when you think because of interest rates and the way that the, you know, ec- economic conditions are right now, you think that, you know, the market's doing terribly. There are these pockets. Um, across the United States and in Canada and Calgary being one of those pockets that are Mm -hmm. still absolute, the markets are on fire. You know, inventory is low, demand is high, prices continue to uh, escalate. And now that's not everywhere right now. I would say it's, you know, definitely in the minority, but, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, you know, I'll call it a definitely a volatile market right now. A lot of anticipation of rates coming down, which should drive uh, demand, uh, back up, but you know, I think in a nutshell, from a macro perspective, the way that I look at it, in particular in the U.S. market, is regardless of interest rates going up and down or what's happening in the economy, there is um, unprecedented demand for homes. You know, people mm. want to own their home, and I don't think that demand is going anywhere. And I think in general, there's a need in both the Canadian and the U.S. market to bring more inventory to market. Um, there is definitely a shortage of housing across both countries. How are you going to get people to want to sell though? Like, I think that's one of the things that I, I keep thinking about. I'm like, well, people who have to move for maybe job or relocation, you know, we all, we know the three D's, you know, your death, divorce and debt. So that's always going to be some factor here, but you know, people. How many people locked in a sub four percent interest rate? I mean, there's re- like real significant challenges. And here's what's gnarly. Uh, you know, I met a guy here in South Dakota, just relocated from Denver. I could not believe this. He, you know, he sold his house within the, re- in the within the last year in Denver, and they lost money. I didn't, like. I don't. I don't know the last time I heard someone I talk heard about story like losing that. real cash like like pop money out of pocket to sell a house wow and it was not a small number for you know any average person i just like it, it blew me away i was like how is that well even? the circumstances you know like you know buying real estate and why people buy homes isn't hasn't changed in forever you know normally people are in a transition period of their life and so Mm. you know primary residential as opposed to a rec property or vacation property is a need rather than a want and so when it is a need as a purchase um you know there's usually some timelines and a sense of urgency attached to that purchase that you know that particular example of the gentleman up in in denver and selling at a loss there was probably some urgency as to why he had to sell and why he either had to downsize or upsize or whatever the the situation may have been. Yeah, yeah. It kind of, honestly, makes. I don't want to laugh about it, but it reminds me of the Office episode. Are you a fan of the Office? Yeah, big fan. Michael thinks he's going to get the job up in New York, and he's like, yeah, I sold my condo on eBay. He's like, don't worry. I, I sold it in record time. I sold it for 40000 less than what I paid for or something like that. It's just like, uh, maybe not the best of things. And actually, that's kind of funny because that episode's probably 10, 15 years old, somewhere that. And it talks about uh, an interesting example. It talks about selling a house on eBay. Online, yeah. Online. I mean, they were still in that. And, you know, you can see it in the office. They had computer monitors that were four feet deep. Yeah. You know, and, and all the – they still had desk phones. And yet here people were buying and selling homes online then. Before we even get into the problems that only solves, why is this still such a foreign concept? Why is this still so far away from being more commonplace? I'm telling you. I mean, I I actually like to think that that episode was probably way more than 10 years ago. It was probably closer to like 15. And um, it's still a challenge to this very day. And you would think, you know, the comparisons that I've always drawn – in our industry in terms of being able to, you know, buy and shop online and is the automotive industry. And it's been 23 years since the automotive industry allowed consumers the ability to shop and build and price um, and buy online. It's been a long, long time, but the real estate industry is notoriously old school. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's slow to evolve. It's slow to innovate. And it, you know, from our perspective, it's the, truly the last B to C industry on earth to digitize the buying process. Season two, episode three of The Office. <laughs> and it originally, the, the original debut was in 2007. So, so what, what year? 2000, oh, wow. 2008, 2009. I'd like wow. to point that out. Make sure everyone hears that. <laughs> yes. The struggle has been real for the real years. trailblazers out there looking to change things. So let's get into only. Yeah. Break it down for me. What are you guys solving for and how are you doing it? Yeah. So, you know, when we began our journey and the inspiration did come from the auto- automotive industry and we just, you know, we were looking at it saying, you know what, why is this industry, why has it not caught up? Mm. And, you know, in particular in the new construction world, which is where I spent the bulk of my career. Um, you know, mostly in new construction in single and multifamily, they don't typically even put pricing online. Um, you know, at best, it's a starting from price point. And, mm-hmm. you know, we looked at this and uh, being in this industry, and I'm, I guess, not your typical prop tech startup entrepreneur where my background wasn't tech. My background has been real estate. You know, I've been involved in land development and, and home building in the real estate industry for 21 years. And this was a problem that, you know, year after year was never getting solved of really digitizing right. the buying process. And, you know, we thought there had to be a better way. There had to be a way and an opportunity to remove friction uh, from the process, remove redundancies from the process and create um, you know, an experience that was more rooted in trust and transparency and a more enjoyable experience for both the buyer and the seller. And so it began um, in the middle of 2019. Uh, we had built an MVP of the platform of this really what at the beginning was a build and price tool. And similar to how you would go online and build and price a vehicle, you were taking that exact same concept and doing that for a home. Oh. And uh, we, we brought it to a couple of our existing customers. Mm-hmm. And um, this one particular customer, I'd say a medium-sized home builder at the time, thought it was a brilliant idea and, you know, said encouraged us to take it to more, you know, builder, developer customers in our market. And so we did that. And, and sorry to cut you off, but this is actually what happens in that sample house that sits in new developments. Yeah. For, for anyone who's not gone through, like, a new home purchase. You walk in, an agent that works for the home builder is sitting there all day long. Low, and they've got up on the wall, they've got prints of the entire neighborhood, they've Floor got plan. every model put into frict- picture frames instead of family photos. And then if you're a real serious buyer, they sit down and it's literally feature by feature. They yeah. build the house unless there's a spec. Correct. Absolutely and, correct. And it's an arduous long process and if you think about it like if even if you have a a high conversion rate 25 percent that means you're not just the people in the door that's people you sat down and did that process with so you're talking like you know for every four people or couples that come in that want to buy that you're spending you know two hours 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 with them and you're not going to get that deal and I'll tell you that conversion rate is not twenty five percent. No, it's be, much lower. That'd be than incredibly that. optimistic. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, the process has been done the same way, you know, for a long, long time. And so this particular customer really loved the technology. We launched an MVP of the platform in the middle of twenty nineteen. Um, they encouraged us to go and pitch it to more. Uh, more groups in the real estate industry. So we did. We pitched it to 15 other builders and developers. And honestly, we had 15 no's. Like 15 companies told us, you know, one after the other, no way. You know, and they looked at us like we were Would proposing. Would they tell you why? You know, it, 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 I think it's scary. I think it's daunting. I think it's very unusual to be able to put um, – to put the pricing of a home and all the details, the options, upgrade specifications, and put that for all to see. You know, there was fears of, well, my competitors will see it. They will Mm -hmm. undercut us in price. Um, You know, a consumer will never come and visit us in the show home or the presentation center because if they can get everything online, then they're not going to come and have that two-hour in-person visit to go through the details that they could do it themselves online. So there was a lot of fear Um, anxiety around the concept and you know they were people would look at me like we were proposing you know flying cars and it was you know the reaction was visceral and it was the same thing with every group that we had spoken to which was really cool idea 
love what you're doing, come back to me in five years. Maybe the world will have changed by then. And it was, you know, 15 pretty hard no's. And, you know, probably the best worst thing to ever happen was, you know, six or seven months later. And in the meantime, we had taken the concept of only and just put it back up on the shelf because we really didn't get a lot of demand or interest in the product. And then six, seven months later, March of 2020, the Mm. pandemic hits and we're all stuck at home. And everyone living in the city, uh, you know, after three or four weeks was looking out the window and thinking, how long am I going to be here? And uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, when shopping malls, retail traffic, real estate traffic had come to a grinding halt, out of nowhere, that second, third week of April of 2020, the real estate market took off like a rocket. The residential real estate market took off like a rocket. And all of a sudden, everyone living in the city was looking to move to the suburbs. Everyone Mm -hmm. living in the suburbs was looking to buy an acreage way outside of town. And everyone and their (laughs) brother was looking to buy a rec property vacation home somewhere, you know, to not have to, you know, or wear a mask for the next unspecified period of time. And so the market took off. And a few of those customers that had said no in the middle of 2019 had called us back in, you know, April of 2020 and Mm. said, nobody's coming to visit us in person. We're not getting the walk-in traffic of looking at the show homes right. and the presentation yeah. centers, but our websites are crashing. People are looking to do their research and due diligence online in advance of speaking to a salesperson. And that was kind of the where the light bulb came off, where we had realized the pandemic had expedited consumer demand for mm. more frictionless experiences. The thing is that's interesting about that is it wasn't that suddenly consumers were doing due diligence online. They had been doing due diligence online, but now it was the only channel to do it. And, you you know, we we used to look at, so, you know, uh, flashback, I got my experience working at a home builder starting in 2008. Wow. Wow. What a time to start that. We went from 50 homes a month to 15 in deliveries. Yeah. And that didn't let up for quite a long time. So I learned all the things about backlogged land and leverage and reassessments and best best lessons ever on cash flow management. Hmm. Uh, we ended up paying contractors in pickup trucks, generators, and even some of them got paid in houses Wow! to just keep production moving. But, yeah. you know, we had billboards cited as our number two reason that people had heard about our communities billboards it's it's so crazy to think about that wow but you know people were looking when they're when they're in the shoppers mode they're looking they're trying to get the more information and i think the one thing that is scary to salespeople is like well if i let go of that information they'll never come talk to me right and the it's just so the opposite you know, people are actually wanting to be educated and they're more than willing to come in if they get that information up front in a little more open and freeing uh, environment. So now you guys have been up and running for a little while now. It's been it's been some time since the world shut down and, and put us into a bit of a dizzy. It's still in a bit of a dizzy. It's still in a uh, dizzy. Yeah. What's the feedback? Yeah, the feedback's been interesting, and you know, like I, I want to tell you know, I'd love to tell you this really shiny, incredible story of like this meteoric rise to superstardom, but the story doesn't go that way. Um, you know, although the pandemic really did expedite that consumer demand, um, we went out there and you know, getting a home builder developer to put their pricing online. Get, getting them to be forthcoming with options and upgrades and what everything costs um, mm-hmm. wasn't something that everyone was rushing to do. You know, and there mm-hmm. was definitely, like we had, um, I would call it a, a sample size of success early in the process um, where, you know, we went from zero to 20 customers in under a year. We were in both Canada and the United States. But what we had realized is that... Um, that step of the equation of the build and price wasn't the wasn't where we were going to achieve incredible scale and growth from the platform. Not to mention there are other really formidable competitors in that space that are doing a phenomenal job of being able to like customize and visualize a floor plan. You know, companies like Anugo and Hiark, and there's some phenomenal uh, companies out there, Focus 360, that are doing incredible jobs um, mm-hmm. at 
doing the visualization component of what your home could look like. And so we were, you know, always very focused on what we call creating this couch to contract experience and digitizing the buying process. And to us, there are three components of it. You know, number one was being able to actually put a price tag on a home and allow the consumer to put it in their proverbial digital shopping cart. That was number mm-hmm. one. And so we kind of checked the box with that, with our first product, which was our build and price tool. Um, the second piece of the equation, which we found to be the most challenging and most difficult, was unlocking a customer's ability to be able to transact and buy that home online. And that's where Verified was born. And that's where we hold all of our U.S. and international patents and IP technology is around the verification process. And in verification, you know, the, there's only two things that stop a consumer from being able to transact such a high value purchase online. You know, one is identity, cred, you know, credential verification. Mm-hmm. And the second piece um, is financials. And if you could, you know, validate both of those items, you know, financial Mm -hmm. and, you know, KYC identity verification, it should technically unlock a customer's ability to be Hmm. able to place an earnest money deposit, sign a reservation agreement and complete that transaction completely digitally online. Wow. And and so, so um, let's go a little further in that. So obviously a big piece of this is financing. How does financing play into this? Yeah, so you know, we we had no intention and still don't have any intention uh, of becoming a mortgage broker or a lender, um, mm-hmm. but understanding that financing is a big piece of the equation. The other piece that's really important is that there's a you know, getting a pre-approval or going and getting a mortgage pre-approval from the perspective of the consumer is a very daunting, invasive process. There's a lot of people that want to know but don't want to know. Um, and it's a pretty stressful process to go through a mortgage pre-approval. It's, there's you know many there's some big players in both the U.S. and Canadian markets that have done a great job at streamlining the pre-approval process using great UI and UX to create these you know same day pre-approval tools. But it's still pretty invasive, and so finance, financing is a huge component of the process. Um, Mm -hmm. in getting that completed, but it's not the only step of the process. There's a number of steps that need to take place in order to unlock a customer's ability to transact a piece of real estate online. Yeah. And I I mean, related to that, like you said, a number of people, you know, to be able to unlock this, like some of the ancillary services that are still here. I mean, if you're going strictly through a home builder, it's a little bit more streamlined because they tend to provide a lot of those services in house. And so you get a little bit more of that all baked into the package. Of course, if you're buying existing inventory, it's a little more free formed. You know, you pick out your inspector if you want to do an inspection. Um, the, the bank has to order the appraiser appraisal. So now you're at the mercy of how many transactions are happening in your area, how many appraisers do you have. How fast do they want to work? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do they even have to leave the house anymore? Anymore? I, I I don't know. A lot of those are just kind of looking at Google Images anyway. You know, um, how many people do you have to get on board, or is it really just the same as any other transaction once you know the customer is under contract? You know, it is a lot more complicated. You know, there's very you know being the single largest purchase decision that people will make in their lives most typically being their home, there are a lot more hoops to jump through. There's a lot more documentation that's required to complete the process. You know, Mm -hmm. um, real estate fraud is one of the biggest challenges facing the industry right now on the residential side in particular. It's a big story up in Canada. There's been a number of cases that continue to kind of pop up of of real estate fraud of people having their homes sold out from right underneath them. Um, Are you talking about Sorry, is this like rerouting the wire or something entirely different? This is like identity fraud. This is people claiming to, oh. you know, essentially cl- cl- people claiming to be the owners of a home, selling a home for a profit, and they weren't the ones that actually own the home. Oh. Um, so, you, you know, we're starting to hear about, you know, and identity theft and identity fraud is becoming more and more prevalent right now than than ever before in particular because identities are very easy to duplicate. And now in the world of DocuSign, 
which has really fundamentally changed the real estate industry from a, like a transactional perspective. DocuSign is like, I would say, the, you know, the single biggest driver of change in the past decade um, in our industry. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to fool the seller or to fool the government that, uh, you know, if you're doing something fraudulent. Wow. I wasn't aware of that um, particular uh, issue of fraud. I am very aware of the growing um, problem of wire transfers being rerouted. Yes. M- much because, you know, the, the transaction on real estate, as you're talking about here, right, you're, you're talking about, like, the discussion of addresses and it's all your personal identification information and your financials and your oftentimes your social security number and or other billing information is just being sent through normal email not mm-hmm. secure channels nothing encrypted it's mm-hmm. just secu- and all you need is one of the 10 <laughs> or more people <laughs> that are on these email chains that will get to the closing table you just need one of them to have a compromised email account and then you know at the end that's where they reroute the fraud the, the wire and if they can reroute the wire and enough time passes even the FBI can't get the money back yeah which is just i mean it, it, it's horrible to to think about that does an you- online experience do anything to protect against that like is there any specific like maybe like natural paths that make this a little bit more secure because you can control the environment and where the transaction is occurring versus kind of free-formed in email. Yeah, there's definitely, you know, I think there's there's pros and cons to it. You know, there's, you know, exactly for the reasons that you just stated are some of the reasons why there's probably still quite a bit of reluctance to digitize the buying process, whether that be, uh, you know, a broker, whether that be an agent, whether it be a builder or developer, there's still that reluctance because of that fear of something going sideways and, you know, um, ruining the reputation of a seller or, you know, ruining the life of a, of a buyer is, is high stakes. Um, You know, I do feel like in the digital world that we are working in and that we are all working towards, you know, with the pandemic expediting this consumer demand for more of these frictionless experiences, um, it's created opportunities to remove friction from the process redundancy, but I think also increase safety and security around the concepts of KYC and identity credential verification. And now it's not as simple as, hey, show me your driver's license or taking a copy of your driver's license, but it starts to be doing things, you know, what we're calling two uh, two factor verification where you're checking IDs multiple times through the process. You're using AI recognition tools to match an ID to an actual human being and having them turn their head you know, three ways and ensuring that they, you are who you say you are. And so I think technology is, you know, I, I don't want to say catching up, but I'd almost say getting ahead of where we need to be. And I think in the world that we're, the frictionless world that we're living in, um, what people yearn for most from a buyer perspective is trust, safety, and security. It's, you know, some of the things that we value most, um, you know, being Canadian or being in the United States, you know, we, we value mm-hmm. our trust, we value our safety and security. And I think when it comes to our finances and our identity, those are, you know, two of the things we want to protect the most. Yeah, there's actually, I mean, through a handful of discussions with other PropTech founders that her are in, you know, doing a lot of, with AI, what I've, what I've come away with is that data in unstructured environments, you know, paper, if you will, or your ID card. But if there's a consistent or a standardized design and pattern to the information, um, actually, this is where AI really takes off and really can be a, a significant safeguard. We had, you know, one of the guests we had on the show, CEO of a company called Snapped, and their whole speci- specification is, you know, identifying fraudulent documents used for tenant applications for rentals. Wow. And they do that for multifamily home or multifamily operators. And, and they, they block a significant amount of fraud because they can pick up, you know, how hard is it to, to get a, a W2 designed? Right. Not difficult it's, at all. No, it's not. And, and, or a tax return. I mean, those aren't very hard. And even bank statements, they're not very hard to get designed. And so, you know, AI is able to 
learn on what those documents should be and the the structure and i mean i'm not the the smartest on this topic so i'm butchering it but uh, i'm excited for all this because it feels like a convergence there's a few pieces that may be that final bit that kind of pushes over to both a more frictionless but also secure transaction that would be that final bit of trust that may be necessary to to move the consumer forward um i'm i'm uh curious here what are um what are you doing now to help drive the growth and adoption? You know, you had the initial crowd kind of come back to you after you demoed. So you still aggressively hitting the road show and trying to get in front of builders that way, or are you starting to see a little bit of inbound demand as people think more about solutions like this too? And even from real estate agents and uh, maybe uh, private sellers, like mm-hmm. how are the, how are they finding you and, and getting to you? Yeah, I would say what's happened now is when we first came to market with only, um, I think people, you know, the industry perspective buyers and customers really felt like we were proposing an all or nothing scenario. Oh, you want me to start selling online and shut down my show homes and sales centers. You're trying to eliminate my salespeople and eliminate Mm. agents. And it was never our intention. You know, we still stand behind the statement that only uh, and verified our our sales enablement tools. They're there to remove friction from the sales process and really do a better job at helping to position um, the agent, the broker, the salesperson less as a salesperson and more as a trusted advisor. And so what we've, I think, what is starting to realize is that it's not an all or nothing. It wasn't, we weren't asking Mm -hmm. um, sellers to shut down their, you know, bricks and mortar storefront operations. We weren't trying to eliminate agents and salespeople. It was a sales enablement tool. And we think that there is, um, there is an opportunity for a healthy balance. Um, We don't think that everyone is going to, you know, wake up one day and decide that the next home I'm going to buy, I'm going to do it completely online, nor do we think that anyone uh, is going to, you know, go through that process completely analog, in person, the old fashioned way. We think there's a hybrid. It's, it's not one or the other. It's a little bit of both. We think that consumers today want to be able to do their research and due diligence in mm-hmm. advance of speaking to a salesperson. And I think that goes for any purchase as we as consumers are making today. And the pandemic gave us that opportunity. And, and I think a lot of people that didn't feel like they had the skills to do online research now mm-hmm. feel empowered to be able to say, you know what, before I go into that store, before I go into that show home or that presentation center, I'm going to research the community, the home, the options, the specifications that I'm looking for so that when I do walk into that show home or presentation center, I don't need to sit there for two and a half hours because I don't have that kind of time. I can spend half an hour because I'm going to walk in and I'm going to know within reason, I'm going to know almost exactly what it is I'm looking for. And I want to know exactly what the price of that product is going to be. And so you know, the pandemic edu- made people more educated um, and allowed them to do more research and due diligence on the purchases that they are were planning to make before they started talking to salespeople. So to me, the future is a hybrid environment. You know, I don't believe that salespeople are going anywhere. I don't believe they should be going anywhere. But I, however, I do believe that they have an opportunity now to provide an enhanced customer experience. You know, to streamline, Mm -hmm. remove Mm -hmm. redundancy, remove friction for the buyer. So the buyer doesn't look at them as a salesperson anymore. The buyer looks at them as a trusted advisor that's ensuring or helping them make the right decision. Oh, it's so good. I I appreciate that going into those details. I'm going to poke a little bit more into the marketing side. Uh, I see a lot of agents gaining popularity on TikTok. Are you on TikTok? Are you guys doing dances and, and songs yet? We, we're we not on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. Um, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, you know, it's not, it's, you know, I, I wish I had time to be on TikTok. But yeah, I mean, there's been, you know, the world that we're living in today is there are incredibly successful agents uh, and salespeople out there that are doing remarkably well because of their social media presence, because of their showcasing their listings and the community. It would seem and- like these ideas would 
would marry like those agents now who have like fully adopted new media, fully adopted building a digital uh, audience and, and brand will really would succeed with with products like this. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the you know the customer that we are looking for at only is the innovator. You know, you're looking for someone who's willing to challenge and interested in challenging the status quo. And yeah. so, you know, those that are on social media that have gained a huge social media following, they're doing the TikTok reels and, and videos and people are looking at their listings. Those are the ones that are going to be um, excited about removing friction from the process, creating more mm-hmm. trust and transparency for buyers and making it a more enjoyable experience overall. Like somehow... Um, as time moves on, there is a semblance of obligation from the industry to try and make the buying process easier. Yeah. We are you seeing any, Oh, sorry about that. Uh, are, are you seeing any um, difference in adoption when we talk about um, agents and even builders? Is there any like cities, is it suburbs? Is there coastal regions where you see this accepted or is it really kind of all over the map? Where you're seeing adoption and, um, you know, is it regardless whether big team, small team kind of thing? Yeah, I I would say it's not necessarily um, geographic. Um, You know, I can't, you know, pinpoint a particular city or region or state where, you know, there's more technology innovation being embraced or accepted. I would say it's more about the team. Um, And what we're starting to find is, you know, it's usually the bigger teams, the bigger companies, bigger home builders, Mm -hmm. developers that want to be first to market. You know, part of their value proposition or part of their, um, you know, their competitive differentiator is being the innovator and being first to market with, you know, the newest technologies and innovations. Right. And so what we're starting to find is the interest that we're generating is from the builders, developers, the agents, the brokers, um, the teams that see themselves as innovators, the teams that are trying to scale and grow, um, the teams that are trying to remove that friction from the buying process and make it a more enjoyable experience. And typically, um, those are the companies and the groups that are trying to achieve you know, rapid market growth and scale. And so it, it, I think it lends itself typically to larger teams or larger organizations that are able and willing to take a bit of a risk in, you know, putting their hand up and being first to market in the regions where they play. Yeah, and I, I can see from, you know, uh, you know if you, anyone uh, listening wants to check out the only website and go to the company page, you can see the advisory board. There's some representation from some big I'd say some pretty solid players yeah. um, that are working with you guys directly. And of course that is a good indication as to like who may be adopting this and having interest uh, in this sort of tech and taking it to market. Um, before we begin transitioning towards the bottom, show, I got a few more questions I want to go through, but one of them specifically, I always like to get a feel for this, you know, last few years, obviously as we talked about, it's been a bit dizzying. Did you have any assumptions or tests that you guys have run with or tried that uh, turned out to be wrong or a mistake that you can share, and what did you learn? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be vulnerable for a moment. Um, you know, I really felt as though um, building and pricing a home online, being able to put the price online, in particular for new construction, I felt like it was a no-brainer. When we started only, that was our our core product that we had launched with. And it was really, we created it out of necessity. You know, how do you allow a consumer the ability to put a home in a shopping cart without knowing what the price is? So we felt like we had to create this tool out of necessity and that everyone Mm -hmm. would jump all over it. And to be honest with you, you know, a year and a half into selling our build and price tool, um, the, the doors didn't get blown off. Um, it wasn't the unprecedented demand from the industry. Not everybody wanted to go and start selling online. And, you know, so when we came out the gate, it was build and price and buy online. And if you look at the market still to this very day, a year and a half later, um, there are a few, and I will say a handful of players across the U.S. 
um, that are are using a buy online in some capacity. But for mm-hmm. the most part, it, it it didn't happen. You know, the move to um, purchasing online has yet to be completely embraced by the industry at large. There are a handful of innovators and players in the market that are that are attempting to do it and maybe dipping their toes uh, in the water, so to speak, a little bit. But I would say that would be, I think, one of the challenges that we had and a mistake that we made is assuming that if you know if you build it, that they will come. And so we built it. Mm. We built this build and price buy online tool, and you know we've we've been successful, um, but not to the level that I think I would have expected um, out the gate. You know, and I still think it goes back to this industry's. Um, old school, pretty set in their ways and slow to Mm -hmm. evolve Mm -hmm. and innovate. And it's coming, but I just maybe anticipated it happening a lot faster than what reality showed us. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, it doesn't so much surprise me. I mean, it's obviously like I'm, I'm I'm always thinking about like, well, how can we make it better? But, you know, I want to throw one more kind of uh, counter argument at you in, and it's, Sometimes friction can be good. So how much friction should be removed from the process? And where do you see friction being a good thing in yeah. buying a home? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you know, where I see it to be a good thing is where I wouldn't call it friction. You know, um, when it comes to building a relationship, establishing rapport, um, mm. and, and delivering an incredible customer experience. My background, when I started my career, I started with the Walt Disney World Company in Orlando, Florida, and it was there where I learned about the importance of the customer experience and you know, delivering a memorable experience that you know, people would talk about for years to come. And I think there are a lot of parallels and synergies in terms of the customer experience that agents and brokers and developers and builders want to deliver for their customer. And so... When I look at digitizing the buying process, it's not removing the salesperson. It's not removing the relationship. And so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when I talk about removing friction, I talk about a lot of the things that people would rather not do in front of a stranger. It's the things that people would rather do on their couch or at their kitchen table uh, in their own home than sitting in a sales office for three hours with a salesperson. So right, to me, right. it's, it's the red tape. It's the administrative tasks. It's the, you know, it's the KYC. It's the identity verification. It's the financing components. Um, it's the disclosure. It's the signing of paperwork. Um, those are the things, that's the friction and the redundancies that I believe needs to be removed from the process to make room for a greater opportunity and more time to be invested in building the relationship with the customer and in, mm. and in creating a more memorable customer experience and not making them feel uncomfortable and asking them to do things that feel invasive. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Jason, we're going to shift here to one of my favorite segments of the show. This is called For the Future. For the Future is when I get to ask each guest who comes on the show to give their best predictions based on the following four questions. Ooh. Are you ready to play? I am ready to play, Nate. Hey, let's do it. All right. Number one, what does only look like one year from now? Hmm. Wow. I think one year from now, um, only will not only be serving the new construction market and single and multifamily, but I really think we will have hopefully been embraced more so and inclusive of the resale market, including agents and brokers and realtors. Um, I think, you know, our goal, and it was the goal from the beginning, is still the goal to this day, is to be the, you know, the digital home buying experience and the digital shopping experience for the entire real estate industry. And we've had these comparisons of the Shopify for real estate, and it still is our goal. If we can help digitize this process, and it not necessarily just be for builders and developers, but also be able to serve and provide a you know a valuable service and product for um, brokers and agents. That would be a win for us. 
Okay, I have to ask now. This is this is totally a rabbit trail because I mentioned in the pre-show that I thought of you guys. Like I was like, yeah, you guys seem like the Shopify for real estate. Have yeah. others said that previously, or was yeah. I the first? We've no, we have heard <sighs> it. Before. We've okay. heard it a few times before, and it isn't coincidental that Shopify is also a, a Canadian-born company. Believe hey, it or there not. it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a good analogy, and it was one that we. Um, it, we were we were painted with very early in the days, and I had to step back and think about it. But um, you know, it's absolutely the case. And Shopify has been incredibly successful in building mm-hmm. this digitized shopping cart experience for retail purchases and online transactions. But I think where Shopify and the Canadian and Shopify, from my perspective, how they've been incredibly successful in their growth and scale is by not trying to be all things to all people. And they've created a really um, Mm -hmm. an ecosystem of integration partnerships. And instead of trying to build everything themselves, they've built this online store of incredible integration partnerships that have made the online Shopify experience so robust by working with people instead of working against other companies. I have a quick Shopify story. And then we will continue with For the Future. I had a store called Off Trail Gear that a buddy of mine and I started. Um, and uh, I was look, wondering if I had one of the stickers on my water bottle here, and I don't. And we, we sold camping gear. And um, I had a post on Reddit go viral and selling backpacks. I did a oh, backpack wow. discount deal. And I literally like whipped up an image in Canva just like – logged in for the morning, changed prices and literally just threw the spaghetti at the wall and went to, <laughs> went to do it and what I was doing for the day. And I get a text message from my partner. He goes, what did you do? I'm like, what are you talking? I don't know, man. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, why are we selling backpacks? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. And then I opened up the app and I just saw the sales refreshing and the sales were coming in. Here's the best part. We were losing like two or $3 every sale. Oh no. Oh <laughs> so, no. Here I am, I'm like, oh, in another office, uh, you know, metaphor, I was like, so the more I sell, the more I lose. Uh, Not the right When business. do we want to end this sale? <laughs> yeah, turn the store off. <laughs> turn it off. Oh, man. All right, I got to give you some data here to preface question number two. Okay. 2019, 6 million. 2020, 6.5 million. 2021 peaked 6.9 million. And estimated 5.8 million for 2022 is the annual home sales. Yeah, I was going to say in the United good. States. So you know yeah. the following question: How many home sales or transactions will there be in 2023 in the U.S.? Wow, you know, I, every, everything is so heavily dependent in the U.S. and Canadian markets on interest rates. And uh, I expect that um, the market is going to start to come back to life this summer as we move into kind of Q3 of this particular year. So I'm going to say the number is going to be higher uh, than 2022. Um, but I Whoa. think, yeah, I, I, I feel like the number is good. Like there is, there is still, in my opinion, unprecedented, unprecedented demand uh, for owning a home. And you can see that by the very low vacancy rates in rental. Everywhere. And everywhere. And, 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 and rental prices. Ex- except for luxury rental apartments. True. Which is, a, is literally just a different class. Different class. So, but if you look in general, and I look at both the U.S. and Canadian markets, um, vacancy rates for purpose-built rental or rental product have never been lower and demand for rental has never been higher. However, there's a number, there's a lot of Americans sitting on the sidelines waiting for that drop in interest rate that have a desire to own their home and 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 get into the market. And so I think there's a lot of dry powder sitting on the sidelines. I think there's a lot of pent up demand. And I think for the foreseeable future, demand will still continue to exceed supply. And as soon as we get a break in these um, unusually high interest rates that we're experiencing right now, I think those numbers will, you know, the number of homes sold will increase. And, you know, I'm optimistic, you know, cautiously optimistic for a change in the market, you know, come the third quarter of this year where we'll start to see people moving back into the home buying market. All right. 
Number three on For the Future, what's one industry trend you think will continue but you wish would go away? This, this is my favorite question of yeah. all of the questions. Get to, get to, puts you all in a seat. of you got to call somebody out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the trend that will continue um, will be – a reluctance of putting pricing online. Um, I, I, I still think it's a, it's a battle that we've continued to fight that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. You know, mm-hmm. you're still seeing these vague, you know, homes from the low 300s or call for pricing. Um, I think that's something that I wish would go away, but I still think it's it's here for a little while longer. All right, last one here on For the Future. What's one thing you believe will dramatically change or fade away in real estate as a result of tech advances? I would say um, I think people's comfort level in shopping for and buying a home online. Um, I think we're becoming more and more comfortable in doing more things online um, you know, that goes from financing, that goes including banking, includes validating your identity and, and credentials. Um, and I think we're becoming more comfortable. Doesn't mean mm-hmm. that we don't need the security reassurances and we don't need the safety precautions and the encryption technologies to be there. But I think, you know, more and more, it's not just the first time home buyers uh, that are comfortable in shopping online. You know, my my parents that are in their mid 70s are comfortable shopping online. And so I think removing friction uh, from the buying process is something that consumers are demanding in every industry and real estate will be no exception. Yeah, I don't disagree. Well, we're going to get to the last three here, Jason. These are questions for our listeners to get to know you just a bit better. Cool. First one, what are you reading? Oh, uh, what I'm reading right now uh, for the third time is, uh, and I it's my refresher book that I pull off the shelf often, is Scaling Up. Oh, I don't know if I've read that one. Yeah, very, very good book. Um yeah, phenomenal book. It's a bit of a Bible book for an entrepreneur. It's Colin um, Mills. And then probably the second one that I'm rereading for the fourth time is Blitzscaling by Reed Hoffman. All right, let's talk about that one here because it's totally out of it's it's out of season right now. I know. I a know. A lot of people did. hating on it. I I know I have thrown some hate towards it. <laughs> yeah. I liter- I literally just did the other day on a on a post from Brad Inman, and I think I specifically called out the term blitzscaling. Yeah. Right. It's why I work for Midwestern startups. Why are you digging into that book? You know what? Um, you know, when you're in a startup in a venture, you know, private equity backed startup, like we are, um, it's about iterating quickly. Um, mm. it's about not dwelling on things for too long. It's about, uh, testing things quickly and moving on. And, uh, I have to remind myself of that all the time that we don't, as a startup, you have a limited, runway you have a finite runway and you you know you must kind of iterate and move really really quickly and run through the ideas test them and then keep moving yeah to confirm because there's a few books here scaling up is this is this Vern harnish Vern harnish yeah okay I, I had the wrong one earlier yeah all right I'm, i just wanted to make sure i had the right one there i uh i just add these to my shopping list as people tell me the good books sure all right, number two, who are you learning from? Well, um, I've got some just phenomenal mentors in my life. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for you know the advisory board that I've been able to surround myself by. Um, you know, where I'm probably learning the most is you know some of the the, the leaders of some of the larger organizations in the world um, in the real estate sector, both from resale. Um, you know, a guy that I pay a lot of attention to. Um, that I'm listening to um, the approach is, you know, Nick Bailey, uh, the CEO from Remax, um, mm-hmm. you know, is is really incredible at driving innovation and pushing the industry forward. Um, and then, you know, I've got some some internal mentors and advisors that I spend a lot of time uh, listening to, like Trent Edwards from Brookfield is another one that's, you know, a, a big mentor and supporter of what, what we're doing. 
Very cool. Last one here. What inspires you? You know, what inspires me is other people's excitement uh, and passion about something. Uh, whether it be what we're doing or what they're doing, I think what inspires me the most is um, my ability to be able to help others. Um, mm. I get my juice from seeing other people be incredibly successful. And it might be the Canadian in me, but I'm a little bit I'm more collaborative than competitive. And so um, I'm always inspired by other entrepreneurs, other whether that's in prop tech, tech or otherwise, of people doing really, really cool things. Because it inspires me to go away and, and work that much harder on what we're trying to build here at Only. And a surprise bonus question. Oh, wow. Where do you recommend, if I'm visiting Canada, that I go for poutine? Oh, well, there's only one place to go. Um, so you've got to go to Montreal. Uh, if you're coming to Canada and you're gonna, you want authentic poutine, you must go to Montreal. Um, there's a few phenomenal restaurants where you can get poutine. And I mean, there's no better place. Also, I would say the number one bagels on earth can be found in Montreal, Quebec. And probably the best smoked meat sandwich you've ever had in your life can also be found in Montreal. So Montreal is the definitive... That's like uh, way up northeast, ain't it? Northeast, yes. Yeah, six yeah. hours okay. northeast of a drive to Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, yeah. All right. I got to pack the bags, hit the road. Uh, I want to get some of that. Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show uh, and sharing so much about only, but also like shedding a lot of light on what's happening in the residential real estate space uh, and the opportunities here to innovate on the buy and sell process. Before we close out, uh, for those who either want to connect with you or they want to learn more about only, where do they go and how do they do that? Yeah, so you can check out our website uh, is verified.re, and you can also find me, Jason Hardy, on LinkedIn. There it is. Uh, hopefully, uh, you come down to the States sometime, I imagine. Often. That's probably where we'll we'll have an opportunity to, to meet up and shake hands. I look forward to that happening. But otherwise, until then, we'll see you later. Thanks for having me, Nate. Thanks for listening to TechNest, the PropTech Podcast. Find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode on technest.io. You can get future episodes delivered to your ears directly by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast apps. Follow TechNest on social media to stay up to speed on new developments, resources, and announcements in PropTech. Your support is greatly appreciated. There's two ways you can directly support this podcast. Share episodes you find interesting and then leave a review of the show in the App Store. From Nate and the TechNest team, thanks for listening.